Sunday morning services here at Grace Church in Franklin. We want to welcome all of you who may be watching by the internet, on YouTube, Ustream, or Sermon Audio Video. Here's a word from the Lord, Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Why should the heathen say, Where is now their God? Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Now join us as we praise the Lord together. Brother Joshua Walsh is going to lead us. seated. I think we're going to have some announcements and then we'll sing some more hymns to the Lord. Good morning. I welcome you to our worship service today. Welcome any visitors that we may have. Uh, we also welcome those who are joining us this week for the John Bunyan Conference. If you want to know anything about the area while you're here, just please ask any of us. We'll tell you where the good spots are and where the bad spots are. No, just It's all good. Uh, we want to continue to pray for those who still may be traveling in. I want to pray for those who will teach us from God's Word this week and for all that will attend, whether in person or via by the Internet. Uh, this conference will survey Paul's epistle to the Galatians and has a theme of breaking free, staying free. This evening's service will start at 6.30 and end at uh, 8 p.m. It continues Monday through Wednesday uh, with two morning sessions from 8.30 to 12.15 and one evening session each day through Wednesday from 6.30 to 8. Uh, Grace Church will be provided soups, sandwiches, and desserts uh, this Tuesday at 12.15, and we ask that uh, food should arrive by 11. We will also have a fellowship dinner on Wednesday evening at 5, and we ask that any food would be, be sure and bring that by 4. Uh, we also want to extend a happy Father's Day uh, from the elders and deacons. We wish every one of the fathers a happy Father's Day. Um, those that are watching by the internet are you as well especially my, uh, my son-in-law, who is a first-time dad this year. Uh, so we praise the Lord and thank him for that. We also, we also want to continue to mention uh, Wallace Haddon, who is uh, not well. Uh, he's once again uh, suffering from depression. Uh, this is usually due to an imbalance of medication levels used to treat him as he has an appointment with a primary care physician this Thursday. Uh, we pray that the Lord will be willing to be with him and his wife Mary as she ministers to his needs. 
Uh, Tom Prince spent uh, two days in Vanderbilt Hospital earlier this week. Uh, he had a kind of, he had been suffering some pain uh, since last Thursday. He is home and doing well, and we have some, uh, some kind of stone, additional test for his liver will be done soon. But let's praise the Lord because they're here today, and we thank him for that, right? We want to continue to remember Judy Barton as she's on the mend and continues to recover from uh, the recent back surgery. Uh, we also want to continue to mention Sue Martin's 53-year-old niece, Patty. Hang on, let me grab a note right quick. Uh, niece of Sue Martin actually passed away at the age of 53 yesterday. Uh, Ken, Sue's brother, was, uh, who was her dad, we ask that you pray for you card. We'll pass that around and get everybody to sign it. So we ask that you remember that family before the Lord uh, as they uh, lay her to rest. We also want to continue to remember uh, Carl Perry, uh, whose only remaining sibling, Bobby, who is 80 years old, has been diagnosed with throat cancer that has spread to his liver. So be sure to remember him before the Lord as well as that family. We ask the church uh, to continue to pray for uh, Jaya McCarthy, who is battling cancer, and her mom, Deborah, who is helping to care for her. They were here this past Sunday, set down the front here, so we ask that you continue to remember them. I also want to continue to remember Patricia Jackson, who is in considerable pain, is undergoing physical therapy three times a week uh, for, on both shoulders. Mary Ann Bishop continues to uh, physical therapy for the uh, impinged nerves in her elbow. We also want to continue to remember George Bishop uh, and his post shingles pain is still unchanged. Uh, he was, had, was scheduled to have a biopsy on his bladder this past Monday. And we pray the Lord will grant them some good results in that. We also want to continue to remember my daughter Lauren and my grandson Bo. Uh, I have a, definitely a praise report concerning that. This past Friday he had uh, another doctor's appointment and he had gained over half a pound. <laughs> So he is up to six pounds and two ounces. So we praise the Lord for that. I'll try to get by there and get as many little snuggles and kisses as I possibly can. And bless his heart, he'll have to get used to that for the rest of his life. Uh, continue to remember Judy and Calvin LePetri as the, they minister to her needs each day. And we also want to continue to remember Joe Turner's sister, Debbie. Uh, she's under, having some tests on her esophagus. Also continue to remember Lily, who is 16 years old, lift her up before the Lord. Also want to continue to remember Shirley Murphy, who uh, is recovering from a torn rotator cuff. Also continue to remember uh, Howie Smith as he serves in the military. We praise the Lord for Michelle George's diagnosis led to the late. And we give him all the glory and the praise. And Gary, we're thankful that you're here today. And we just ask that you continue to remember him and, and her and their family as the, she continues to recover. Uh, as a reminder, if you'd like to support the ministry here at Grace Church, place an offering in the box located on the table in the foyer. Are there any other prayer requests to make mention of or anything else that needs to be said? Yes, ma'am. Good. We just want to repeat what Beth said there about uh, she talked to Barbara Long, said her and Gary are both doing well. Uh, we praise the Lord for that and ask that you continue to remember them in your prayers as well. Is that it? All right. Well, we'll have some more singing. I want to say good morning again to everybody and once again if you're just now joining us over the internet by YouTube or Ustream or on sermon audio video we want to say a welcome to you this morning we're thankful that you're here to worship with us and I was told to make one more quick announcement brother Bill just told me to let you all know that when we did the whole shuffle this week we just had the carpets cleaned in the building um, there's two offering boxes that are usually out on that table out there and somewhere else but one of them is is misplaced so if anybody knows if you ha happen to set that somewhere if you would just let Dr. Foster know or one of these other men know and we'll uh, try to find it <laughs> um, number 270 let's see I think we're going to skip over one of our hymns let's go to f it's called Feeling Mighty Fine <laughs> you all know this one right Statler Brothers can you stand up Miss Lynn asked us to do this this morning stand up with me and you may have to clap your hands. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. I woke up with joy in my soul. Because I knew my Lord had control. That's a good reason. I knew I was walking in the line. Because I'd been on
Are you feeling fine? That's how it's supposed to go. Say, feeling fine. Say yes. Amen. <laughs> There's plenty, plenty of things in the world and in life to not feel too fine about. But you know what? If we can keep our eyes fixed on the Savior, we can feel just fine. <laughs> all right. You all, I think, can be seated, I hope. And then we're going to, uh, Brother Bill and Miss Lynn are going to come up and treat you to a few songs. Well, I hate for you to sit down. But... Oh. This week, we're going to hear about how our Lord Jesus Christ has set us free. How He's given us life. How He's raised us up together.
Many, many years ago in the hills of West Virginia, coal mining country, there was a fellow very much like the man that Jimmy Dean sang about, Big John. This man was a huge man, about six foot six, weighed about 260, 70 pounds, and he was as mean as he was big. You know what happened? He ran into somebody that's bigger than he was. He ran into the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was converted. And after he was converted, many of his coal mining buddies ridiculed him and picked him and just scorned him. And John could have broken them in half with one hand, but he always restrained himself and one of the ways that he restrained himself was by singing a certain song and he would break out in the coal mine way down under the ground and he'd sing this song for strength. We're glad to have all of you here today with us. Uh, we have a special speaker this morning, an old friend from up in Massachusetts. I pronounce it Leicester, Massachusetts. Is, is that correct, Gary? Is that even close? Leicester, 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 Massachusetts. I'll tell you where it is. It's just a little, while, a little ways out of Boston. <laughs> And he, uh, Gary is one of, one of our favorites here at Grace Church, and I wish we could have him down here a little bit more often. So we asked him to speak for us this morning. 
And then he's the first speaker this evening in the Bible conference. So he's also going to speak this evening uh, when our conference begins. Now, let me make two quick announcements that uh, will put on me kind of qu quickly. First of all, we have two men who are going to need to be picked up at the airport and maybe taken back. The same person doesn't have to pick them up and take them back, but well, Blake White is coming in at 4.30 on Tuesday afternoon. He's going to return on Thursday at uh, 9.40. And uh, Doug Gooden is going to come in on Monday at 2.40, and he's going to return Thursday. So if any of you, if anyone has any free time, you're able to pick some of these men up, please let me know about it, and we'll make those arrangements. Then secondly and lastly, at the Williamson County Fair this year, which will be held in August, the Right to Life people contacted me and they need, a, uh, they need somebody there. Uh, hours, the hours would be six to 10. I don't necessarily think a person has to stay all four hours. It probably would be easier. Uh, I think this goes uh, for about four days and ends on Saturday. It may go Monday through Saturday, but on Saturday they'll be there all day. But during, during the week, they'll be there from 6 in the afternoon to 10 at night. That's Williamson County Fair, and that's the Tennessee Right to Life. If you would like to be there, here's what they do. They train you, they meet with you and teach you and show you what to do. And, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in doing that, if you're interested in trying to help, and that is a, a worthy goal, let me know and I'm gonna put you in touch with Barry Phillips. You remember Barry who came and spoke here to us about a month and a half ago, fine fellow. All right, give uh, Brother Gary a welcome and we're going to ask the Lord's blessings as we usually do on the brother that's going to speak to us. So if you'll Raise your hands, stand up together and raise your hands to the Lord and let's stretch our hands and ask him to help us. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other I moment, Brother George. Are you going to be standing for the word? Is that the idea? <laughs> you may be seated. Do you remember when you first got into the Bible, uh, when you attempted to read the word for your very first time? Uh, do you remember what book you were recommended to read? Or did you ever recommend this particular book to somebody who was just going to start reading the Bible? What book am I thinking of? Amen. You, why, why do we recommend the Gospel of John? Well, because it, it's somewhat simplistic in some ways. It highlights the person of Jesus, obviously, and it magnifies the Gospel in, in many other things. But we, I think for the most part, we recommend John because that seems to be the most uh, comprehensible for someone who's starting off. But you know, we that have been saved, like I've been saved over 40 years, the more I read the Gospel of John, the more profound I find it to be. I find it to be one of the most rich, the richest book of the Bible. And I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about and can agree. Not only that, the Gospel of John would be a book to talk about Father's Day, that would certainly be a book because Jesus came to exegete the Father. He's the Father of all, and especially of those who believe, so we want to praise him. So obviously, 
Turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 1. While you're doing that, I want to thank the congregation for remembering my wife in your prayers. Uh, Dr. uh, Foster has been so faithful in communicating with me weekly, uh, asking how she's doing and her progress and so on. And my wife, Michelle, and I really appreciate uh, your concern and prayer. She's very, doing very well. She's finished with all of her treatments, and uh, that's all she needs to do now is uh, get uh, every three months checkups. And so far, so good. So we're praising the Lord, and she's rejoicing. And it was all in the Lord's hands anyway. Thank you for uh, the support. <laughs> really, we do appreciate that. Okay, John chapter 1. Everybody knows the Gospel of John. Everybody knows chapter 1. But I want to read a few verses with you, beginning at verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. John bear witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. 16, and of his fullness have all we received in grace, for grace, or rather grace upon grace. For the law was given by Moses, but, or grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And besides that, I want to turn to one other verse just to complement what we just read and what I'm going to, about to say, and that's in John chapter 5 and verse number 46. 546, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I have something to say to you. He wrote of me. Can you imagine the boldness of someone saying that about the Scriptures that had been there with the people of Israel for for centuries, highly regarded, respected, anticipation of a future Messiah coming, and here he's saying, Moses wrote of me. Now Moses, we know, didn't write the whole of the Old Testament, of course, but he did write the first five books known as the Pentateuch, but better known as the Torah, which simply means the law. The Torah to the Jew would be something like what maybe the Pauline epistles might be to the church. The Torah to Judaism was central. It was key to the, the, their belief system. It was the didactic portion of the scriptures that they abided by and sought to follow. And so when Jesus says, Moses wrote of me, In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says to the Jews, search the scriptures, or in searching the scriptures, you think you have eternal life. You know, sometimes people think just because they read the Bible that they're right with God. There's a lot of Bible readers that are not children of the living God that have never been born again, sad to say. And Jesus is addressing them from that standpoint. You're searchers of the scriptures. You're readers of the word of God. But this is what he say, says. This is the treasure. This is the key to the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. They are they which testify of me. When Jesus met with the two on the road to Damascus, uh, not Damascus, uh, to Emmaus, and he went alongside of them, and asked them what their manner of communications was. And they said, what, are you a stranger in town? Don't you know about this Jesus of Nazareth? Well, we thought he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. He was our hope, but our hopes are dashed. Well, anyway, Jesus played along with them, so to speak, walked the pathway. It says he opened up to them the scriptures, beginning at Moses and the prophets. And by time he was done, they said, did not our heart burn within us? while he talked to us by the way, and when he opened to us the scriptures. What he opened up to them was about himself. And they describe the feeling, the response from Jesus' exposition from the word about himself 
and they were thrilled. Their heart burned within them over the enthusiasm about the Lord Jesus Christ. Shouldn't we have a similar attitude as well as we read the word of God? In, in the following verses in that chapter, when Jesus spoke to his own disciples after his resurrection there again, it says that he expounded unto them, beginning at Moses or the law and the prophets, and he says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Isn't that the key? Isn't that really where we get our understanding? I was a reader of the Bible for about three, three and a half years. I do believe the Lord used the word, and he touched me, if I could say, first from Matthew 6, 19, where Jesus says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. God used that verse, and he awoke me. But I, and I believe my spiritual journey began at that point, and I started to read consecutively and consistently through the word, but not to a whole lot of profit until the Lord opened to me my heart in understanding from Isaiah 53, 5, that he was wounded for our, my transgressions, bruised for our, my iniquities, and the chastisement of our, my peace was upon him, and with his stripes we, I, was healed. Hallelujah. That was the second touch. I only, on the first touch, I saw men as trees, as it were, but the second touch, the Lord gave me an understanding where I could see clearly now. Sometimes people are in between the first and second touches. I mean, I know I don't have a whole lot of theological ground to say that, but I think experientially, I think some people can attest to that, that the Lord started something in their life, but then it climaxed at a certain point, maybe through a message that was preached, maybe through a word uh, that someone gave them, or from the scriptures themselves, God touched them. What power there is in the word. You know, we were in Nashville yesterday, the last place I think I'll ever want to go again on a Saturday night. Uh, it's despicable what takes place there, and I think, man, how in the world could the gospel penetrate a generation like this in an environment like this? Really, really, it's hard. And I think that kind of attitude is growing and growing and growing, and God is getting pushed out further and further and further away from mainstream society and people's minds. But, praise God, uh, the Lord is still on the throne. He still has an elect people. There's still more to be saved. Paul says, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So we, don't, we, do, ha we do have hope and we don't have to give up. But you know what makes it difficult? In some ways, a lot different than in the apostolic period. Just think of a, a, an early apostle who goes into, like Paul, into a synagogue. They have some common ground there. There's a common denominator. This book, the Word, the Torah, the Law, and the Prophets were regarded as sacred scriptures. There was a place to begin. We don't have a place to begin with some people. We're more like on Mars Hill where we have to speak to a heathen generation where there are many gods of all kinds of uh, false gods of people's imagination, even if they even think of having a god of any sort. Paul, when he went to Thessalonica, then goes to Berea, and Paul opens up the word. It says they skirt, search the scriptures daily to see wh whether what Paul was saying was true or not. What a wonderful way to examine the truth of what's being said. Because earlier in the chapter in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, he opened unto them the scriptures and proved to them out of the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And it says, and some believed. And right after that it says, and others believed not. Doesn't it all go back to whether you believe or not believe? That is a determining factor. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I do a lot of open air preaching every week and it's one of the key scriptures that I often use to people as they, they're, they're going into a methadone clinic. That's where I preach uh, every, every Tuesday morning, starting at 6.30. And there's a line of about 40 people that are waiting right across the street. And I like to, love to say to them, listen up. He that comes to God must believe that he is. 
And I say, how many of you believe that God is really a God? Do you believe in God? Raise your hand. Be surprised how few people there would raise their hands. And for those who do, I say, amen. But let me take you a little further. Jesus says, if you believe in God, and praise God you do, believe in me also. And then go on to tell him, no one comes to the Father except by me. Christ is the bridge between God and man. The one mediated between God and man is the man, Christ Jesus. Be sure you have him as the Lord and Savior of your life. What do I want to speak to you about this morning? I want to talk to you about Jesus, the Torah gleaned from John's Gospel. It's a new title <laughs> that I put on this uh, sermon. Never preached on it before. Matter of fact, when Brother Bill gave me the nod to come and preach, which was about two weeks ago, brother, uh, I said, I don't know what I want to speak on. I, said, I was reading in the Gospel of John, and I just prayed, Lord, help me, give me something for the flock of God over here in Franklin, Tennessee, and I'm going to give you what I hope the Lord gave me to give to you. Now, of all the Old Testament characters in the Bible, which one do you think is the most mentioned in the New Testament? What is it? Well, you're, you're thinking of books that are quoted. I'm thinking of names of individuals, and I'll help you out there. It's Moses, number one, 78 times, and Abraham, second, 70 times. And if you compare that to the other names of Old Testament people like Elijah, David, etc., you'll find them mentioned maybe a dozen times, 20 times. But Moses and Abraham, 78 and 70 times referenced in the New Testament. And John particularly focuses on those two individuals. When the apostles and Jesus himself would go into the temple, Oftentimes, the word was, it's always opened, and from the scriptures, it has to be gleaned, has to be proven. I want to, with you, glean through the Gospel of John and show you how Jesus is the new Torah, the Torah of the new covenant period, which I think is sort of a good introduction in a way to the book of Galatians as we start the study tonight and through the rest of the week. I'm looking forward to to the study. I've been enjoying reading through Galatians. I hope you have. If you haven't, try to get into it as much as you can beforehand. I think it would be helpful. Uh, the more I read that book, too, the more I love it. And that's how it should be in general with the Word. But let's look, if you would, with me about Jesus being the Torah. And we're going to look at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy quickly as we think of Jesus as being the Torah of the New Covenant period. Well, the Gospel of John begins with something that we all would trigger back to, and that's in John 1, 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face. How does the Gospel of John begin? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see a similarity right there, in the beginning, in the beginning. What's the first thing God does after he begins creation? The first thing is God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus was life, and him, him, in him was light, the light for the world. And the darkness did not comprehend it. So Jesus, you could say, he stands out in the darkness, just like God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And in that same chapter of John, in verse 18, we read that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son was in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. He has declared him. Now, when Moses went to the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, as he's going in the wilderness, and all of a sudden he turns and sees a bush that is burning but not being consumed. As you know, he draws near and the Almighty God communicates with Moses. And Moses, in this conversation with the Lord, says, 
if I'm going to go back to Egypt, who should I say has sent me? And the Lord says to him, tell them that I am that I am has sent you. What phrase sticks out most in the Gospel of John about Jesus? The I am. I am the bread of life. He can go not as a Moses, but a greater than a Moses, because Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen him whom, who sent me, because I and the Father are one. He was the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. What a spokesperson for the triune God was God himself in the flesh, the Lord Jesus, who describes himself as the I am. Just think of that. He's coming into the world as the I am. I am the bread of life. He's the true manna from heaven that will, never, that will never hunger or thirst. Think of the contrast. Our fathers did eat that bread in the wilderness and died. Moses gave them that bread. They died. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He's a pillar of fire by night so that we won't walk in darkness. He says, I am the door. He's the entrance to the green pastures in the paradise of God. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd protects us from the bears and lions of demonic intent. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's the Elisha that touches and makes alive the dead. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I like what Thomas Akempa says about that. I am the way. Without the way, there's no going. I am the truth. Without the truth, there's no knowing. I am the life. Without the life, there's no living. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without the way, there's no going. Without the truth, there's no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. What a powerful statement about our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the new Moses who doesn't leave us below at Sinai but he brings us all the way to the Father. What intimacy we can have with Almighty God, God the Father. Jesus introduces us to the fatherhood of God unlike anybody else could. could. No one could compare to what Jesus could say to us about the fatherhood of God. He was in the bosom of the Father. He was the eternal Son of the eternal Father. That's why we have to maintain the pre-temporal sonship of Jesus. I don't understand how some theologians could drop that idea of Jesus being a son before his coming into the world, created in the womb of Mary. He was always the eternal son. He was eternally generated, as they say, as the son, as well as God, too. The Father was eternally the Father. I think it's very important to maintain that the relationship of son and father was an eternal one. Jesus didn't get born to become the son of the father, but he was always the son of the father. Otherwise, how could he say that he has come to exegete, to tell out, to exposit for us who the father is because no one knew him like Jesus did. And he's sharing that knowledge that he had with you and I so that we now, with the Spirit indwelling us, we too can call God our Father who art in heaven, my Father who art in heaven, through the spirit of adoption that the Lord gives to us. Now, the Israelites never had that kind of intimate understanding and knowledge of the Lord. They equally were forgiven people. They had salvation, undoubtedly. But as Hebrew says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The bar has been a little bit more elevated in that there's more revealed than had been revealed before to him that much is given, much has been given to us as compared to what was given in the Old Testament. Jesus says if, if Abraham and others had heard what you heard and seen what you heard, but they haven't, you're hearing and seeing things that have never been spoken before, so we have an aggrandizement of truth in Revelation as coming from the Lord Jesus and one of the other I am's as he says, I am the vine or the true vine. He's the transformed bush, the transformed bush that bids us to draw near to God. The Lord had to say to Moses, don't come near me. You've got to take the shoes off your feet. I'm introducing myself to you. 
I'm a thrice holy God. You've got to take the shoes off of your feet if you're going to draw near to God. And our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's no less as holy and sacred and requiring the same standards with us. Sometimes we approach God in too much of a carefree, uh, irreverent way rather than a respectable, honorable way, remembering that God says, if you're going to draw near to me, take the sandals off of your feet. You are standing on holy ground. And it's amazing that we can stand on ground, holy ground with a holy God, because by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, Hebrews 10, verse 10. So what the Lord is, is what we are now, because he has given us his righteousness, and we stand in perfect relationship with a holy God, and we can come before him with praise and thanksgiving with a clean heart. Now, the next thing in in John chapter 1 here is, and what is important in the book of Exodus, of course, is the Passover lamb that had to be shed and the blood sprinkled on the upper door post, the two side post, and God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Well, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming down the banks of the River Jordan, and he had been baptizing for a while, and had baptized multitudes of people, but now suddenly the world stops, as it were. And he says, basically, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look who's coming this time. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the what? The world. The world. In John chapter 1, it says, He came unto his own, John 1, 10 and 11, but his own, who are the own there? His own people, Israel, and they received him not. But to as many as received him. Now it's broadening out the Gentiles. To as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the children of God. You see, you're not a child of God by nature. You're a child of God by supernaturalness, by the miracle of the new birth, because verse 13 says about those who receive Christ. The Arminian leaves it there and puts a period. You've got to receive Christ, but wait a minute. Where does the authority, the power, the ability to receive him come from? Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but what? But of God. We want to say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Truly, salvation is of the Lord from first to last. We we rejoice over that. So Paul says, God forbid that I should glory. It's of him that you are in Christ Jesus. We can't boast. We can only say, thank you, Lord that you brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and you set my feet upon a rock. You put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. He raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the beggar out of the dunghill and sets them among princes. Come on, brothers and sisters, this is too good to be quiet about. This is exciting stuff. Now, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Exodus, and this is what it's about, Jesus is the new Torah. Let's keep that in the back of our minds. In Exodus 12, verse 4, it says, when the Passover lamb was to be taken, each house was to take a lamb. But it says this, notice this, if the house be too small for the lamb, invite your neighbor. When Jesus comes into the world, John says, here he comes. He comes. This lamb is too big for Israel. He's not behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of Israel or the Jew, but the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. The lamb is too big for the house. It's not ever the other way around. The house is never too big for the lamb, but the lamb is too big for the house. And John is saying, we've got the Passover lamb, that lamb that's come into the world, and now he is, he's described throughout John, this, he's the light of the world, he's the savior of the world. God so loved the world, why? Because the gospel, the, the vine has gone over the wall. The gospel is 
not contained. It's, it's going everywhere. It's to be broadcasted from the east to the west to the north to the south. Go out into all the world and constrain them to come in. Jesus says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. Caiaphas even said, one man should die for the people, that nation, and not that nation only, but that he should gather in one all the children of God that were scattered abroad. And that's you and I. We were the ones that were scattered abroad. We were like the Ruth. Why have I found grace in thy sight that thou shouldst take knowledge of me? We have Moabites. We're Gentiles. We don't belong to be a part of the olive tree, but he takes that, those that are wild by nature, he grafts them into what is nature, and now we can partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Wow. That's what he's done for us, brothers and sisters. Now, when John baptizes Jesus, he says, I saw the Spirit descending like a dove and remained on him. A dove. Why a dove? Jesus is the Torah of the new covenant, and we're going to glean that from the Gospel of John. When Moses is in the ark and the waters abated, he wanted to know if they were fully abated. And what does he do? He sends out a dove. The dove returns. Why? Because it says there was no place for the dove to rest its feet. No place. Think of it this way, brothers and sisters. If Jesus hadn't come into the world, there would have been no place for the Spirit of God to be able to reside and come down. But Jesus is that one my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, the spirit descends like a dove and finds rest upon the son of God. There's the perfect place where the spirit of God can abide. How exciting. So Jesus is baptized. It says about Moses, when he went through the Red Sea, that the people were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And what did he do? He was leading them out of Egypt. When Jesus comes out of the water, John the Baptist repeats again to his own disciples and others and says, Behold the Lamb. And says, Many of them left John, followed Jesus, and said, Where do you dwell? Come and see. And they went and they followed him. Where is he taking them? He's taking out of what now is defunct Judaism. He's bringing them into a new era, a new distinct period of time that's now going to be known as the new covenant period of time where he's going to be with his people. He's taking them out of Egypt was known as John describes in Revelation, Jerusalem, which is spiritually Egypt. He's taking them out of spiritual dead Egypt. And he's bringing them to the promised land. Where do you dwell? Come and see. Aren't you glad that we've come through the waters, as it were, with the Lord? We're beholding the Lamb, and we're following the one who said, come and see. Where do you dwell, Lord? I want to be where you are. Now, the first miracle that Jesus does, we know, is mentioned as the first in the second chapter of John. What is the first public miracle that Moses performed? He turned the water into blood. Jesus' first miracle, he turns the water into wine. And the Bible says wine is that which cheers. Blood is judgment, wrath, but the wine is cheerful joy. And that's what the Lord Jesus did for us. Again, we're seeing the new Torah, the new G, the Jesus in the, in the, as the new Torah in the Bible here. Chapter 3, Jesus is very distinct about this. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must I, the Son of Man, be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto myself. This was sort of the, uh, 
the imagery that was mentioned when Charles Spurgeon was sa uh, saved. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else, Isaiah 45, 22. And he looked, he looked, and he lived. And those that were bitten by those poisonous, venomous snakes, those that looked were instantly healed. And Jesus is saying, I am the serpent lifted on the pole for the healing. I don't know if you ever noticed, but uh, the medical staff, how they have on their arm um, the badges with the picture of the serpent around the pole. Everybody's noticed that, I take it. That goes right back to the book of Numbers. There's some reality to that. The healing that comes from knowing the Lord. Make a brass serpent and put it upon a soul, on a pole. And that's what our Lord Jesus said, that's what I'm going to be doing. In the fourth chapter, he meets the woman at the well. The woman had had five husbands. She was living with a sixth man, unmarried. And now she's meeting a seventh man. Moses, when he went to the well, he met the seventh daughter of the daughters of Midian. What was the father? What, Midian, was that the father's name? It's interesting, isn't it? At the well is where Moses got his bride. What is it? The priest of Midian, correct. Seven daughters, she's the seventh daughter, and Moses is given the seventh daughter, Zipporah, to be his wife. And Jesus, to the woman at the well, you could say, in a sense, he engaged her, and she and he became one spiritually together. That's in the book of Numbers. We already made reference to this. Moses gave them manna in the wilderness. The people that ate, they died. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. They had to go day after day after day to get the manna in the wilderness. With us, it's a one-time deal. When we truly embrace Christ in salvation, we will never hunger, never thirst. He truly becomes our shepherd, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, what? I shall not want. Do we want anything more than the good shepherd in our lives? Isn't he more than satisfactory to us? No wonder the hymn writer said, take the world, but give me Jesus. Oh, the world looks down on us like, oh, you poor saps, you religious nuts. You, you're missing it. No, man, we're not missing it. We've got something far better. Oh, yes, oh, yes, there's something more, something more than gold. To know your sins are all forgiven and that you're on your way to heaven is something more than gold. We have far greater things with Jesus Christ as our bread of life that we are partake, have partaken of. Now Leviticus, where do we see Leviticus in the gospel, John, as we glean through it? I'm, I hope you're getting the point. When Jesus opened up to them the scriptures and expounded unto them the things concerning himself, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when they were supposed to take two goats and upon one of the goats the hands of the priest were laid and the sins of the people of Israel were confessed and that animal becomes now the scapegoat. The other one is taken, is brought into the temple and is slain. So one dies, the other one lives. You have to have them both together to have a full atonement, so to speak. What do we have here pictured for us in the Gospel of John? John 10, 18, Jesus says, No man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down that is going in, be slain in the temple, and I have power, authority, to take it up again. That's a scapegoat that's cast out into the wilderness, into a land uninhabited. It's the life of the Lord Jesus. He was wounded for our transgression. Yes, he, he uh, as it says in John 5, that he was, uh, let me get that verse, uh, who was delivered for our offenses. That's the goat that was slain and raised again for our justification. Beautiful picture of Yom Kippur, is it not? The death and resurrection. Now Moses, in the book of Numbers, he says, after the people were grumbling, the way's too high, they didn't like the food, they, all kinds of complaint. Moses says, I can't handle this. These people are off the charts. I'm going crazy here. I'm way overworked and underpaid, whatever. He was just stressed out and says, Lord, I don't know what to do with these people. I can't handle the burden. 
The Lord told him what to do. Gather 70 people together, 70 men of renown, of respect. Bring them together. And what does the Lord do? He takes the spirit that was upon Moses and he distributes it to the others. What is that for us? Jesus says, greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. The spirit upon Jesus wasn't remaining there. It didn't reside there perpetually in the sense that it's now distributed to us. We become the 70, as it were. We're now bearing the burden. We are now ministers of the gospel. We are the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. The Spirit has been shared with us, as it were. Like the Spirit taken off Moses and given to those men in Numbers chapter 11, so the Spirit that was on Christ, the Holy Spirit, is now given to us. So greater works than these shall you do. Why? Because I go to the Father. That's, that's where the power comes from. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Because why? All authority is given to me. So we have that kind of confidence and conviction. The book of Deuteronomy. Moses dies in the wilderness. It seems like it's the end of the story uh, for him. He's buried there. God buries him. Uh, unique, isn't it, that he buried him. But he has to assign somebody to replace him. His name is Yeshua. Jesus, as we would translate it in our day. Yeshua, Joshua, takes his place to go across to the promised land. When Jesus dies, he doesn't leave us on the other side, as it were. Jesus says, I'm going to go away. And if I go away, I'm going to send you another comforter. Israel needed another Moses, needed another comforter, needed another guide. Jesus says, I'm going to give you, as a greater than Moses, another guide who will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's the promised land. That's the kingdom of righteousness that we have been transferred into. Tells us that in Colossians 1.13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Praise the Lord for the spirit that's been given to us and that we're not left with just the Messiah who died and was risen from the dead, but who says, I'm going to send another comforter, another one like me, who's going to carry you, as it were, through the wilderness journey all the way to the promised land. After that you heard the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So we praise God, have the Holy Spirit in us sealed until the day of redemption. We can never lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a permanent resident within us. When David says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, He's speaking as a king, and kings were given a special unction of the Spirit for doing their kingly service. So there's no parallel, really, between Psalm 51 language of David to us in our occupation of the Holy Spirit's residence within us. Praise God. He assures us that he's with us to the end. Now near the end of the Gospel of John, when Judas was going to betray him, and he, he got the Roman soldiers together, they knew where Jesus was so that they could go and capture him, and they finally approached Jesus, and Jesus says to them, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. They were coming to the burning bush. They didn't know it. They didn't understand it. They thought that he was just another rebel who was guilty of treason that they wanted to capture, they want to have, have him bring, brought to the Roman court and persecuted and, and so on, uh, and, and, and put to the stake or to the tree and crucified. Whom seek ye? I am. And it says they went backwards and fell to the ground. They didn't have any sandals off their feet. They didn't have any respect for the ground that they were standing on. We're coming to capture Jesus. Where is he? We want to lay hold on him. Hold on, folks. Remember the Superman series when Superman, Clark Kent, 
He's just an everyday newspaper reporter, I believe, something like that. And uh, when the occasion arose for him to get transformed, he goes into that phone booth, he rips off his coat, and he pulls it off, I shirt sure off, and there is the big Superman. Well, that's the Lord Jesus for a moment. He just gives a little flash of glory. Do you know who you're dealing with? I am that I am is who you are approaching. And therefore, they go backwards, and it says they fell to the ground. They, they don't just go backwards. And I have a feeling that when they went backwards, they fell forward. <laughs> like, you know, they're all going to praise him. Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A few more. I think I can sneak them in before we close. Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. He says, I sanct he's praying to the Father, I sanctify myself that they might be sanctified. We should be thankful that Jesus has gone into heaven for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25 says. Now going back to the book of Exodus, in the Torah, we have the high priest is anointed with oil, and then each of the priests also were anointed with oil. Speaking of sanctification, holiness, well, the Lord Jesus went into heaven and set himself apart for direct mission and ministry to the church. It tells us in Mark 16, after his resurrection and ascension, and it, it says this phrase, and the Lord working with them. Interesting expression, the Lord working with them. He wasn't finished when he said it is finished, meaning that I'm done with this work and these people, not at all. He's just got another job, so to speak. Now he's acting as a merciful and faithful high priest who lives to make intercession for us so that by his being sanctified, set apart, he can operate within us in a way that we realize his influence and power upon us in our lives. <coughs> he has made us to be, like him, a kingdom of priests. That's what they're called in Exodus 19. That was God's desire for Israel, that they be a, a national priesthood of people. But that failed. That wasn't the case. But we are described, as John says in the book of Re Revelation, when they sing, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sin and has made us, what? Kings or a kingdom of priests to God and his Father. That's what we become. Now in Deuteronomy, Moses is buried. He can't cross the Jordan. He can't take them across. But Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you shall be also. Moses couldn't say that. I'm going over with you. And I know he wanted to. He never crossed the Jordan River. Didn't get on the other side. But Jesus did. I'm going to prepare a place from you, for you. I'm going to the true promised land. And I'm an anchor for your soul, both sure and steadfast, that entereth that within the veil. He is like the tugboat that has gone in and secured our future salvation. Because where he is, there we're going to be also. Oh, how sh we should be desirous, not of heaven, so to speak, but of him who's in heaven. Today you will be with, not in paradise, but with me in paradise. Be with him. Hallelujah for that. But you know what? Something's interesting. Moses didn't get into the promised land that he's buried, but who was speaking to the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is possibly Mount Tabor, as they speculate that where, the, where this took place? When Jesus was transfigured, who was there? Moses and Elijah. How did Moses? He does get in the promised land. And the only way is how? Because of Jesus there. And they spoke of what? His decease or his death in Jerusalem. How did that happen? Grace, brothers and sisters, is what brought Moses across the other side. Even Moses isn't going to get there. 
like a Ruth is going to get there. Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Moses was on the Mount of Transfiguration talking about the death of the Lord Jesus. That should be what our theme is, brothers and sisters. Just think of what our Torah, our new Torah, the Torah incarnate, we could say, has done for us. These are just some glimpses that we, we see in, in, in the Gospel, John. There are many more, too. I don't want you to say that this is exhaustive. I'm not sure if anybody's ever read or taught this. I'm not... I don't know, but I hope it commends itself to you. At least it's something that I see, that I, I see parallels and similarities here. It, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus. He has declared them. Moses could only be, so to speak, a representative. But Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen him who sent me. A greater than Moses is here. And you know... The Jews did know their Old Testament. But unfortunately, in hearing, it says, of the reading of the law and the prophets, every Sabbath day, it says this, they did not hear the voice of the prophets. Acts chapter 13. Did not hear the voice of the prophets. 2 Corinthians 13, uh, 3 rather, talks about the veil that is upon their hearts even until now. But when, it goes on to say, verse 16, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The, see, the veil is preventive for seeing. But when the veil is removed, now there's liberty and joy. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, where is the Spirit? The, the Spirit is the one who removes the veil and invades the life of the person, and now we can see what we could never have seen before. We see Christ from beginning to end in the law, which we looked at. We could look at Jesus in the prophets, but I hope you got a, a little sense of how when Jesus opened up the scriptures and expounded unto them. Talked about that dove that came down. Talked about the lamb when the house is too small. These are all pictures. These are types of the Lord Jesus. A brother, I think I may have mentioned this to you before, in starting a service, he says, let's all take our hymn, our hymn books. And everybody went and reached and grabbed their hymn book in the back of the pew. And he said, no, no, take out your hymn book because that's what this book is about. It's all about him. To God be the glory, great things he has done. I guess I'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for our Lord Jesus for making to him, to us, to be altogether lovely. Lord, thank you for showing us these things that are precious in the word, that reveal to us so much about your son, Thank you, O oh God, for the great salvation that you have made real to us. And Lord, if anyone here in this room does not know the Lord Jesus and doesn't have that hope of dying and being with Christ or leaving this world and being in the paradise with the Lord, we ask, Lord, that it may please you to turn them to yourself, open their eyes, show them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that his sacrifice on the cross was a sacrifice for their benefit as well as ours, Lord. If they put their faith and trust in you, have mercy, O oh God, we pray. Bless our day today, Lord. Thank you for each of the fathers, Lord, that are in this room, and many a father, Lord, across the lands, and may we be better fathers, may we love our children more and our grandchildren, and may we be men of God that can live for you, Lord, and that can be great examples to our own family members as well. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you told us about the Father things that no one could ever have told us. And for this, Lord, we give you glory and praise, O oh God, in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Did you get it? <clears throat> that was great. I don't assume that anybody knows everything, but you know the word Torah, that's the word for law, the Torah. So what Gary has told us is how our Lord Jesus Christ is our new lawgiver. We don't have to take the law of Moses out. There's nothing wrong with the law of Moses. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou bear false witness, all of those things are good. But like he has told us, they're all fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. 
And he answers all of those injustices to the law. And now we are free in him. That's why he emphasizes that. That's great, Gary. That was a good, a great message. Thank you, brother. Uh, 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 the John, John is full of it. You're right. <laughs> all right. Now, this evening, 